This section examines the piston. The piston, with its connecting rod and bearing, transfers the force of the combustion and expansion of the power stroke to the crankshaft. The piston itself, its rings and the piston or gudgeon pin are together called the piston assembly. The cutaway shape on this piston allows it to clear the counterweights on this rotating crankshaft. The shape of the piston crown depends on the shape of its combustion chamber and its compression ratio. The piston crown may be flat, concave, dome or recessed. In diesel engines, the combustion chamber may be formed totally or in part in the piston crown, depending on the method of injection. So they use pistons with different shapes. The piston must stand up to great heat and pressure. It must also change direction from about 10 times a second up to hundreds of times a second. In most engines, the weight of the pistons is important for engine balance. This is why pistons should only be replaced in matched sets. Some pistons are forged, while others are cast aluminium alloys. All pistons expand as they heat up. As there is more metal near the gudgeon pin, this area tends to expand the most. To allow for this, many pistons are machined into a slightly oval shape. This is called cam grinding. Then, as the piston heats up and expands, it becomes round. Other methods to control expansion include steel struts or ribs, expansion slots in the skirt, or slots called heat dams that restrict movement of the heat. This section examines piston rings. Piston rings keep a tight seal within the cylinder to stop the heat and pressure in there from escaping. They also stop oil passing up into the combustion chamber. New rings and cylinders have minor irregularities and when these wear off, the rings will make a better fit. To help this along, the rings can be given a porous coating. It's softer and wears more quickly than the ring material, which is usually cast iron. To prevent wear, the face of the piston ring can be coated with a harder material, like chromium, that operates well against cast iron without scuffing. They are split so they can be fitted into grooves in the piston, and to expand against the cylinder walls. When they're removed, their diameter's larger than the pistons. So when they're installed, they're compressed and the gap is almost closed. Tension in the rings keeps them against the walls. There are two main types of piston rings, compression rings and oil rings. Compression rings must seal against compression loss during the compression stroke, or the air-fuel mixture won't be fully compressed. They must also seal properly during the power stroke, or combustion gases are forced past the piston into the crankcase. This is called blow-by. A plain compression ring has a rectangular section. It's held against the walls by combustion pressure behind the rings. A tapered ring seals against pressure too, but its slightly tapered face helps scrape oil off the walls as well. Faced rings are designed to better resist heat and wear. A ring that's chamfered or grooved exerts increased pressure against the walls. It's also called a torsional ring. Its shape creates internal forces in the ring so that when it's installed, it twists slightly upwards. 
During intake, the ring scrapes surplus oil off the walls. During compression, they tend to slide over the oil and not carry it into the combustion chamber. In the power stroke, combustion pressure forces down on the top of the ring and also against its back. This straightens it so that it has full face contact with the cylinder walls for effective sealing. Oil control rings prevent excessive oil working up into the combustion chambers. It can be a one-piece ring that depends on its own tension to hold it against the cylinder walls. Slots in the ring and holes in the piston behind the ring let oil return to the sump. Many oil rings are segmental types with three or four segments. They have two side rails and an expander which also acts as a spacer for the rails. They depend on the expander to hold them against the walls. The expander is made of thin steel with a series of crimps to give it an outward spring force. This section examines the connecting rod. The connecting rod connects the piston to the crankshaft. It's fastened to the piston at its little end by a piston pin, also known as a gudgeon pin. In some engines, the pin is a press fit in the small end of the connecting rod. In others, it's clamped to the connecting rod with a clamping bolt. Another method lets the pin float in both the piston and connecting rod and it's held with circlips. There's a bearing in the small end of the connecting rod. The big end of the connecting rod has a detachable cap and carries two halves of the big end bearing. The big end is attached to the crankshaft at the crank pin journal. Connecting rods must be very strong and rigid and as light as possible. They're subject to stretching, compressing and bending, so they're highly stressed. They're cast or forged to form an H near the small end and an I near the big end. This shape provides greater strength to resist the stresses than a solid rod of the same mass. To maintain engine balance, all the connecting rods in an engine are a matched set. 